Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Welcome to this live Tech Tuesday with me, David Smith, over here at OM Digital Solutions. Sorry about the slight technical mishap just then. I hope it wasn't too bad for everybody. Um, I hope you're all well. Welcome and thanks for joining me. Already uh, nearly 200 people watching. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you uh, taking time out of your day to come and sit and listen to me waffle on for a sort of half an hour, 45 minutes. I appreciate that. Uh, say hi in the comments. Let me know who you are, where you're from. I am, of course, David Smith. I'm a technical expert for OM Digital Solutions and, of course, your OMD cameras. And today I'm here to talk to you about Winter Bocker. Uh, and we will talk about a few things related to Winter Bocker. Of course, it's not just Winter Bocker, but now is a great time to do it because the fef festive season uh, is upon us. So we'll look at a few different ways that you can do that. And we'll also look at some best practice ways to try and take photographs with really nice blurred backgrounds, uh, particularly containing lights uh, that you might see at Christmas time. Uh, like I say, do please pop your questions in the comments. Uh, I'm flying solo tonight, so I'm operating all of this on my own, which is incredibly scary. So if anything goes wrong, I am the only one to blame. But I can do things like putting little banners up, asking you to pop your questions into the comments, and I can also switch some video feeds around as well. So let's just head on over to the comments and say hi to some people. There were some uh, questions already in the YouTube comments waiting to go uh, from, we had one from PR Marine Surveyors. So hello, hello, uh, PR Marine Surveyors. Hope you're well. They've got a tough six or a TG6 camera and want to know how to do sort of Bokka style backgrounds with that camera. Now, before I kind of go on, I should probably explain to, to some of you what Bokka is. Uh, some of us know, some of us don't. So it's nice to be able to explain it for everybody. Uh, and Bokka is an interesting word because we all say it slightly differently. Uh, it's a Japanese word. You can say Bokka, you can say Boka, you can say Bokeh. Uh, but ultimately, it doesn't really matter. It all means the same thing. Uh, and it relates to the very soft, round globes of light uh, that come from points of light in your background. So it's really nice kind of light, soft, globy lights that come from little pinpricks of, of, of illumination. And that's what that refers to. And you can get small bocker and you can get big bocker and you can get soft bocker and you can get feathery bocker. Uh, but ultimately, it's creating that really nice, aesthetically pleasing background. So PR Marine Surveyors has a TG6 and wants to know how to do those kind of Bokka backgrounds. It's really, really simple on that camera. You've got an A for aperture mode on your TG6. You can just turn the dial to the A mode and then make sure that the F number on the screen at the back is at F2, which is the widest point on the, uh, that that lens can go in terms of aperture. And then make sure that your background is as far away from your subject as possible, and you'll create really lovely backgrounds. And you'll see a little bit more about how to do that if you watch the rest of the session. Uh, so we've got Mark in New Jersey. Uh, good to see you, Mark. Thanks for coming in. Marsha, hello, Marsha, over in Florida. Good to see you. Darren, a regular. Merry Christmas to you, Darren, as well. Andrew, uh, Peter in the Netherlands. Loads of you, so many people. Um, I can't say hello to everybody, so I'm going to consider this a big blanket hello, and then I'll keep glancing over to my comments to see if there's any specific questions relating to what we're doing today. First things first, though, I'm going to make sure that all of my external cameras are on because I'm going to show you a few things. I've got one up there, and I've got one over there. I'm going to be, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to be running on an EM1 today uh, and, and various lenses, and I wanted to look at those lenses first with you before we kind of go ahead and have some sort of demonstrations um, that's looking a little bit more lively than this Christmas stuff behind me. Um, so, of course, you can create bokeh or that lovely blurred out light background on pretty much any lens if you work hard enough. Uh, but there are four specific lenses that I want to have a look at today with you. So I'm going to bring some of these in here. We're just going to have a look here. There we go. Some of you may notice I have a lovely new desk here. This is my Christmas present to myself. Um, that's how sad it is over here in Cambridgeshire. I've got a lovely new desk for Christmas. Uh, and it shows off these lovely lenses very nicely. And these are the four that I'm going to look at today. So first of all, and some of you may think it's interesting, but we're going to look at the 60 millimeter lens, which is a, designed as a macro lens, but is also superb for portraits as well. So I'm going to have a little look at how the 60 millimeter macro works because it's got some very interesting effects that will happen with our bokeh in that lens. Then I'm going to look at the superb 75 millimeter f 1.8 lens. So this this 60 millimeter is a 2.8 uh, widest aperture, uh, and this 75 millimeter is a 1.8 lens. And this is superb. These are all primes, by the way, so they're all fixed 
focal lengths. There's no zooms tonight for this one. So we'll look at the 75 millimeter. This is fantastic. There's a slightly longer, closer focusing distance, but we'll talk about that when we have a little look at that on the camera as well. Then we're going to look at the superb, absolutely superb, in my kit bag for years and years and years until the advent of uh, the pro version, the 45 millimeter f1.8. For the price of this lens, this is a superb uh, budget portrait lens, but superb quality, nice and fast at 1.8, superb sharp quality, lovely and light as well. It's a, an absolutely amazing lens. We're going to have a little look at that one. Once we've checked out what that 45 millimeter f1.8 can do, we're then going to move over to the 45 millimeter f1.2 Pro series lens. So there's going to be a direct comparison between these two lenses to have a look at. Now, it's interesting that we're going to do a direct comparison with these two lenses today, uh, because if you look at what's going on in the new year, we're going to have some lens focus sessions where I will do more comparisons between the uh, premium lenses at f1.8 and the pro lenses at f1.2 as well. So we're then going to look at that one as well. So we've got our 45mm 1.2. Let's see if I can do this without them all rolling around. Our 45mm 1.8, that one wants to have a little roll around as well. The 75mm f1.8 and then the 60mm f2.8 as well. So those are the four that I'm going to look at today. Now, by all means, they're not exhaustive of the lenses that you can use to create this kind of bokeh, but I thought there'd be an interesting four lenses to have a little look at. So we'll move on to that and we'll have a look in just a second. I'm just going to have a quick scan again through the comments because it's always nice to try and pick people out and say hello. Uh, we've got Jim in Maplewood in the, in the USA. That sounds like a lovely place. Uh, we've got Jane in North Devon, also a, a lovely place because I've been myself. Uh, Kathy from California. Catalin in Romania, fantastic. Margaret McKenzie uh, near Inverness, brilliant stuff. Good to see you all in. Uh, okay, so remember, any questions that you want to ask about this, please do put it into the comments and I will have a peek over and see if I can pick them up. And if I don't pick them up, I will try and come back into these comment feeds afterwards and go through them individually. So keep an eye out in the next couple of days for me answering your questions. Okay. Uh, and also feel free to ask questions about any other technical aspect of the kit. You know, if there's something that you've been dying to know, I'll try and pick it up <coughs> and, uh, and see if I can solve it for you. Uh, let's have a look. We have got a question in there already from Chris. Chris has got a question related to photographing the Christmas tree. Uh, Chris attempted to do this and it was a total blur. Big fat bucker balls, which is fantastic showing, but the camera kept sharpening the focus. Uh, so even when you're on manual focus, you couldn't seem to see what you were seeing. Okay, so the big difference is that if you're shooting a Christmas tree with all those beautiful lights on there and you want to get bokeh, you kind of can't because you either get a sharp tree, which produces sharp, tiny pinpricks of light, or you produce a blurry tree, which produces the blurred bokeh balls of light. And it's very difficult to get both unless you do some sort of compositing on that image. And that's purely down to physics. That's just the way that physics and photography work. It's the point at which the light sharpens. So you're not doing anything wrong there, Chris. It's just actually that's how it happens. So what we try and do is we want, if you want nice blurred bokeh on your Christmas tree, you might want to have something in front of it that's going to be your focal point, say a Christmas decoration or a wreath or something like that, and create some distance between that and your Christmas tree. Because the more distance between your main subject that you want sharp and the light, which you want to create bokeh balls from, uh, then the bigger those bokeh balls are going to be. And that can be on any lens, even down. If you're using really long lenses, you can create things like that, even at f4 and f8. So it's all about distances. Now, I work <laughs> in quite a small area. So this is my very tiny studio. It's not that big. Uh, so the distances that I'm working with today is I've got some fairy lights over there. Uh, and then the distance between those fairy lights and the subject matter that I'm going to be shooting today is, I would say, approximately four and a half to five feet. And then the distance between the subject and my lens will vary depending on the lens because they've all got different close focusing points. And to be honest with you, the more difficult one that we're going to look at today is going to be this 75 millimeter because this one has a close focusing point of, well, 84 centimeters or 2.76 feet. So I have to be that far away from the subject to create that kind of focus on the subject and then background bokeh. So Chris, don't worry, you've not done anything wrong, but hopefully it will become clear as we have a little look through now. Okay, Megan's in. <laughs> Megan McCarb's in, talking about the weather. The weather's forgotten that it's summer at the moment. I wish it was summer here, Megan. 
I'm very, very, uh, very jealous. But actually, you're saying that it's forgotten that it's summer. So perhaps sharing the similar sort of weather to us, which is dreary and, 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 and wet and cold. Right. So let's have a quick look. Let's move over to our camera. Let's have a look at that. There we go. Nothing super exciting to see there, but you can kind of get an idea what's going on in here. It's all out of focus because the camera has just been turned on. But this gives you an excellent idea as to what's going on in the background. So there are some fairy lights just randomly strewn around the place. Um, and they're, they're nothing special, just battery powered fairy lights on a black background. Now, I've got at the moment the 12 to 40 f2.8 lens on my camera. And I've put this on to give you an idea that you can use a zoom lens, but you will see different results. Okay, so I've got this down to f2.8, and I'm just going to bring this into focus for you all. Apologize for any creaky floorboards as I move around. So I'm just going to half press them, bring that into focus. So, of course, you can see here we're using an old OM10, a lovely little model that I use for quite a few things. And we've got a couple of snow people in there as well. They're having a great old time. They've been on the eggnog earlier this afternoon. I promise not to tell, but there we go. The secret's out. But there is a slight problem here in the sense that I'm using my camera as though it was fresh out of the box. So if I make any adjustments to it, because I'm, I'm using manual mode at the moment, it gives me complete control of my ISO, my aperture and my shutter speed. Uh, if I make any adjustments to it here for the shutter speed, for example, we're not actually seeing a result on screen. We're just seeing a consistently lit view. And that's because I'm using an EM1 two for this, an E1 Mark II, uh, and this model actually has something called Live Boost on by default, which just gives me a pre-lightened view. It doesn't give me a spectacularly awesome uh, view of my actual exposure. So first things first, before we start delving into the blocker and the apertures and all sorts of things, let's turn that Live Boost off so what we see is what we get. I'm just going to also switch a light on as well so we've got our lights on. So first things first, let's head into the menu. Uh, and I've got it pre-highlighted here, into the menu, into the um, custom menu there, down to D2, and your live view boost in manual shooting should be switched off. What that will now do is give us an exact view of what our final image is gonna be. So if I was to, for example, now speed up the shutter speed, you'll see my image is gonna be darker. And if I slow it down, it's gonna be brighter. Now this is all gonna happen because I've fixed everything else. I've fixed my ISO at 200, and I've fixed my aperture at f2.8. So whatever I'm changing is gonna make the exposure change like this, and I get to view it. Now what I could do here is I could actually go into my super control panel by pressing OK. I could switch the ISO to auto. Now by whatever means I change now, the camera is going to try and keep the exposure looking the same as I see on screen, but it's gonna be altering the ISO because the ISO is an auto. So if you see there on the left bar, as I swizzle around with my shutter speed, the ISO is going higher and it's going lower, but the exposure is staying the same. Now a good way to be able to handle that correctly is by using, in this instance, spot metering. And spot metering in manual is only gonna be effective if you're using auto ISO. So again, we can press OK to the super control panel and we can go across to our metering modes just here and select spot metering. Now, thankfully on the Olympus systems, spot metering goes from the AF point. I'm using a single AF point and my metering is gonna follow that AF point around. You can see there that as I move into the darker areas, my exposure becomes brighter and as I move it up to the brighter areas, it evens it out. So I'm actually exposing for the precise point where I'm focusing, which is super useful. On this occasion, focusing there, using my spot metering right there on the PUS of Olympus, uh, at a 30th of a second f2.8, the camera can't actually achieve it very well. It's flashing away on the side there saying it wants to use ISO low 100, but actually it needs to go lower and it can't. So what we're going to do is we're going to speed the shutter speed up to allow it to achieve a much more reasonable ISO. So that it stops flashing which means that everything that we see is what we're going to get. We can take a quick picture of that, have a quick look. Let's view this uh, nice and clean. And there we go. We can see we've got a nice, uh, adequately exposed picture, uh, and we've got our bocker balls in the background. Now, the problem here is that I am at full tilt on my 12 to 40, which means that I am 40 millimeters in. I can't zoom in anymore, um, so I can't actually get that closer using my focal length. So those bokeh balls are quite tiny. You think f2.8 is a very fast lens and it is indeed for gathering light, but in terms of bokeh, it's kind of just about there. Now, 
what we can do is we can move slightly closer. And if we watch those Bokka balls now, they suddenly become slightly bigger. So what we're actually doing is making our Bokka balls bigger by reducing the distance between the camera and the subject, but maintaining the distance between the subject and the background. So if I just creep and get super close to my camera, then we can get really lovely big Bokka balls, but that doesn't help me on the crop because that's not the crop that I want, okay? So in order to get the crop that I want, I'm actually getting, yeah, mediocre Bokka balls here. So, Let's just take that picture one more time so we've got reference point. That's our 12 to 40, uh, 2.8 lens there. Let's press play and have a little look at that. Now, what I wanna do now is I'm gonna pop on another 2.8 lens. So realistically, the Bokka balls shouldn't be much different, but it's my 60 millimeter 2.8 macro lens, which does also work as a portrait lens. So here we go. So straight away, the view's slightly different. We're out of focus, so let's find our focus. Our crop is different, of course. I haven't moved the camera on the tripod, but the Bokka balls have got larger because our focal length is more compressed. We've gone from a 40 millimeter uh, focal length to a 60 millimeter focal length. So we've compressed that subject together, and we're now getting those nice big Bokka balls in the background. And what I'd like to bring your attention to in this instance is the shape of the Bokka balls in the background in the sense that they are slightly hexagonal. So the 60 millimeter produces this slightly hexagonal uh, bokka, and that's as a result of the shape and number of the aperture blades inside the lens. So we can get a slightly different effect from our uh, 12 to 40, which gives us nice round bokka balls, and our 60 millimeter fixed 2.8, which gives us slightly hexagonal bokka balls. Now, let me leave that up there for just one second. Uh, and I will come in and let's see, I've got um, do, 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 do. one of those brilliant stuff. So you can see the picture and you can see me. And we'll have a little look at some of the questions that we've got in here. Hello, Fred from Long Island. Hello, Bonnie from Cincinnati in Ohio. Hello, Jerry from, I can't even say that. That's somewhere in Texas. Thanks for coming in. Uh, I don't, some place names I won't say because I don't want to offend people. Um, and we've got Philip from Ontario, and we've got a question from Neville. Neville asks, how weatherproof slash rainproof is the EM1 Mark III? Well, the EM1 Mark III has an IPX1 weather seal rating, which means that you can be out uh, in all kinds of weather, um, rain, snow, things like that, and providing you maintain all of the weather seal points, which is things like your lenses on securely with a weather sealed lens, your hot shoe covers are on, things like that, uh, then you should not have a problem. The EM1 Mark III, however, is not submergible. That would be one of these. So if you want to go swimming with your camera, TG6 all the way, but your EM1 Mark III can, can pretty much survive a total downfall for a, quite an extended amount of time. We do like to prove that on a regular basis, but unfortunately we've not been able to get anywhere in real life to do that with people. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Todd said he thinks I'm on manual focus, but the image is being taken at a stopped down aperture. Mm, yeah, the aperture is completely, uh, well, the, the aperture is completely wide open, Todd. Uh, and it was on uh, fully automatic focus. Denny's been using Olympus for over 50 years. Spectacular. Thanks for staying with the family, Denny. Uh, and uh, Denny's got an E5 and an E2. Fantastic stuff. Okay. So I'll try and come back to some more uh, comments in here as well. I've just spotted one that I'll come back to in a second. So let me bring back uh, the feed fully and we'll get back up. And so this was the 60 millimeter macro, okay? So we're gonna pop that off. And I'm now gonna move over to the glorious and one of my favorite portrait lenses of all time, 75 millimeter F1.8. Now it's interesting because Remember, we're on micro four thirds, so 75 millimeters is actually 150 millimeters in terms of equivalent crop. So what you're seeing is a crop of 150 millimeters. So now what you'll see here is everything's out of focus because I am far too close to be shooting uh, on this 75 millimeter lens. I need to be at 2.76 feet, give or take. Uh, so I need to move my tripod back all the way back here until I know that I can get some focus. Let's try that. Oops, still not quite far enough. Let's see, there we go. Okay, so now this is my crop. So I can get a reasonable crop. Let's just adjust the angle of my tripod. There we go. 
And you can see I've still got spot metering on, so the, the exposure is fluctuating as my AF point moves around darker and brighter areas. So let's get it up here, which is the most important part, and it equalizes out the exposure for me. Now look at the size of the Bokka balls. How beautiful and fantastic are they? Absolutely glorious. So we can take a nice, beautiful shot there. Oops, no, we can't. That's an f2.8 shot, which brings me on to explaining why <laughs> what we're seeing is slightly different to what I get in this picture. So what we're seeing here and what we're seeing in this picture are slightly different because on mirrorless cameras, well, quite a lot of cameras actually, the view that you're seeing, the live view, is with all the aperture blades wide open on your lens. So we're seeing an f1.8 view, but I forgot to change my f-stop from the previous f2.8 lens. So I need to stop that back down to f1.8 to get the actual view of what I'm seeing. There we go, that's much better. So we actually see that that's uh, 2.8 on the 75 millimeter, and that's f1.8 on the 75 millimeter. We get absolutely, oops, we're absolutely, there were some birds in there. They're definitely not in the studio today. So you get some really beautiful, soft, round bokeh balls from those tiny little pinpricks of light. Now, of course, you might not be able to shoot at f1.8, but you might want the crop value of f1.8, and that is absolutely fine. f1.8 does bring in a lot of light, so if you're shooting in a very br bright environment, that might not be helpful, but then spot metering again is gonna be your friend in that. So wherever you're taking that spot is where the camera's gonna meter from. Now, if we take that spot to somewhere up here in the dark, you can see there that that's really not helpful because there's a lot of light flooding onto my camera, and the camera's metering from that tiny little dark spot in the background. But what I can do is I can actually find focus on one of those fairy lights just back there. And, uh, oops, actually, let me bring it back to the camera. Let's find focus on the camera. I can take my focus point to a bokka ball, and I could lock my exposure based on the brightness of that bokka ball. So let's take it to the edge of the blue one here, because that's giving me a reasonable balance between the lights in the background and how well lit the subject is. And then we've got the AEL slash AFL button on the rear of the camera. And if I press that once, that locks my exposure from, from the spot metering. And then I can remove my AF point to the place where I'd like to focus and take that shot at that exposure. And that gives me a much different exposure. This is the one where I metered from the Olympus logo. And this is the one where I metered from the Bokka ball in the background. So we're getting a much nicer exposure by locking that AEL AFL in. You can see down there on the bottom left, you've got a little green box that says AEL, telling me that it's locked to the exposure. Now, if I press that again, wherever my AF point is, now the camera's going to meter from that point. So if I press it once, there we go. You see it's gone slightly darker because it's now metering from that metal plate with the word Olympus on. So remember to use things like spot metering. Remember to use your auto exposure lock to lock that metering wherever it is, and then you can refocus somewhere else as well. Now, so this is our 75 millimeter, okay? So that's our lovely 75 millimeter. I'm just gonna break these down so that we can see them side by side. Uh, that was our, oops, that's our 75 millimeter at f2.8 because I forgot. We'll get rid of that as well. And there are people out there shouting at me going, don't delete in camera. It's only a demo, it's absolutely fine. Uh, there we go. So that was our 60 millimeter, that was our 75 millimeter. Let's change over now. I'm gonna move my tripod slightly closer because I can do. I'm gonna leave that image up. And I'm gonna switch over to the premium 45 millimeter, the 1.8. It's a nice, light, tiny little thing. It's got a nickname. They call it the Plastic Fantastic, which is, uh, which is not far off, to be honest. And then let's have a little look at the crop now. So we've got a slightly different crop again because we're at 45 millimeters. I'm just gonna reduce the angle that I view at there and bring this back into focus. Okay, so there we go again. So just to reiterate what we can do in terms of spot metering, let's find light from the bokeh ball. The blue one seems to be a good one, so we'll find light from the bokeh ball with the AF in spot metering. Okay, and then press AEL AFL to lock that and then bring our, expo uh, our focus point back to where we want it to be, which is about there. So we've got a good exposure and we've got nice soft round bokeh balls. We'll take that photograph now. This is our 45 millimeter uh, and this is what it looks like. 
beautiful, lovely and soft, nice and crisp and clean as well. So super, super sharp. But what you do need to bear in mind is that at f1.8, you have this spectacularly shallow depth of field. And I want to bring to your attention here on this corner, because where we've got Olympus in nice and sharp, we've got the detail ever so slightly behind it. This is only 12 millimeters behind it that is seriously out of focus. So you need to bear that in mind when you're taking portraits and things and you want bokeh. What you may have to do is you may have to stop down your aperture to something like f4 to create a nice depth of field for any portraits. But in doing so, make sure that your subject is further away from the background. So the further away from the background they are, the bigger these bokeh balls will be. And bearing in mind, remember, we're only using about four and a half to five feet of distance behind the subject today, and it's still creating quite nice bokeh balls. If you can make that distance 10, 15, 20 feet, you're going to get some exceptionally beautifully large bokeh balls from that. So that's our 45 millimeter. It does have a slightly closer focusing distance. So we'll just bring it in a little bit closer. There we go. We've got nice close. And again, the closer we get to it, the bigger those bokeh balls are going to be. But there will become a point like this. And when your camera is behaving like that, it's telling you I'm too close and I can't focus. So you must always be aware of that nice focusing distance. There we go. Create a little bit more of a crop. And frame up nicely. Oops, still a little bit too close. There we go, and take the picture. So you can get these really, really beautiful size bokeh balls from that just by moving a little bit closer as well. But like I said, it's really important to keep an eye on that depth of field. Now, oh, excellent, time is running very nicely this evening. Let's leave that up there. I'll say hi again. You get very out of breath, just jumping up about and talking constantly. Um, but the problem is, if I stop talking, it's not very interesting for you guys. Let's have a look at what people have got to say. Effion, Effion from Wellshot. Good to see you in here, sir. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you and the whole Wellshot team. Um, let's see. Denny says, with all the glass uh, I have, can I use my lenses with the new camera? Absolutely. Denny, you can get a uh, an MMF3 weather sealed adapter for your e-series lenses to go on an em1 series camera and because the em1 series camera has phase detect and contrast detect focusing systems then your e-series lenses will work very very well uh, so yes of course Denny, you can do that michael is that with the zoom at 40 millimeters if you're talking about the 12 to 40 absolutely some of these comments might be way back so apologize uh, but <laughs> Michael spotted it in the top corner. That's absolutely fine. Sue says it's really helpful. You're welcome, Sue. And great to see you in here as well. Caitlin's in from Seattle. Great to see you as well. We have such a great worldwide audience. Thank you so much for popping in as well. Uh, PR Marine Surveyors has asked again, how do you do Bokka backgrounds on the Tough TG6? So as I mentioned at the start, uh, if you missed that bit, you can view this afterwards anyway, because this video is not going anywhere. So any mistakes that I make are here forever. Um, but with your TG6, you want to use the aperture priority mode, which is A on that dial on the back of the camera. Make sure that the F number is at F2. Get nice and close to your subject and make sure that the light in the background is nice and far away. And that will create lovely, lovely Bokka. Tim Farmer says, St. Louis says hi to all. Hello to St. Louis. Thanks for coming in. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Todd, the answer for the question below as to why the image I was you were seeing through the viewfinder was not sharp, but the image taken showed more detail. Uh, yes, so that's the difference in uh, a wide open aperture and a slightly stop down aperture. And what we see is not the aperture uh, that we're using unless we take control of that with a depth of field preview button, which will stop the aperture down to the actual f-stop that we're using. It's slightly more complex. Uh, let's have a look. Um, how do you do this if you use back button focus? Uh, that's from Cheryl. Cheryl, exactly the same way. If you're using back button focus, you use it exactly the same way. Uh, however, the problem with that is that you can't use the auto exposure lock, so you have to be a bit more sneaky about how you maintain that exposure. You might need to use exposure compensation slightly uh, or use your shutter speed to equalize that exposure balance. Uh, Tom's a Canon user, but looking into Olympus for the weight savings. Come over to the dark side, Tom. You won't regret it. I promise you uh, these cameras are superb and a third of the weight of, of other big cameras. Tyrone's asked a great question, asking what role does image stabilization play, such as on or off? So tonight I'm on a tripod. I should realistically be switching it off. Shh, don't tell the bosses. I'm sure they're not watching, but I've forgotten to switch it off tonight. Uh, but we do recommend that if you're on a tripod outside, out and about, that you do turn the image stabilization off. But if you're hand holding it, image stabil stabilization is phenomenal. Fully stabilized by a half press on the shutter button, 
Uh, and on this model that I'm using here, it's five and a half stops. On an EM1 Mark III with the really beautiful telephoto lenses up to eight and a half stops. So some fantastic stabilization in from that. Lynn Fletcher, yes, we're being recorded. Don't worry, go and do everything that you need to do and come back after Christmas and we will see you again. Okay, so what I want to do now then is go back to the feed and I'm going to show you the last lens and we're going to get a little bit more creative with this as well. So I'm going to remove my 45 millimeter f1.8 and I'm going to pop on my 45 millimeter f1.2 Pro lens. If I can just pop that on there really quickly and we'll have a little look at that. So we shouldn't see any difference in the crop value because those two lenses were 45 millimeters. But in straight away, almost immediately, we can see these bokeh balls are now enormous because they're crossing over very nicely. We're going to take a very quick shot just there to make a comparison between. Oops. <laughs> and guys, I've done it again. I've taken a shot at f1.8 from the previous lens, not f1.2, purely because... <coughs> the view has shown me f1.2. So let's get that down to f1.2 and take that lens again. <coughs> Sorry, take that image again. Working live, such joys. Anyway, let's have a quick look. This is f1.2 on our pro lens, and this is f1.8. So I'm going to bounce between the two, and you can see a slight difference. The real difference in the crop is because I've moved the camera. But the actual uh, compression is exactly the same. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see how the big difference in these bokeh balls is this complete crossover now with these bokeh balls, which is absolutely fantastic. And I'm going to just let you all absorb that for a little second while I have a quick sip of water because it's really, really dry throat tonight. Or today or this morning, depending on where you are in the world, because we've got 400 beautiful people all over the world viewing us. So we get this exceptionally large bokeh. We get this really beautiful extra extra light coming into the lens. Really, really beautiful. Now, there is a minimum focusing point on this lens as well, and we just about hit it there. So you need to be at around about that point. <coughs> Excuse me again. So those are the differences that we're seeing. We're going to do more comparisons between the 45 millimeter 1.2 and the 45 millimeter 1.8 after Christmas. We're going to do some lens focus sessions as well. But what I wanted to do on this instance is just get a little bit creative. I want to put some fun into this. I want to get this nice uh, and Christmassy. So I've made myself some DIY apertures. And what I mean by that is I've simply made some cardboard cutouts that are the same size as the front of my lens and I put a shape in them. And I'm going to pop those over the front of my lens right now and you'll see instantaneously. I've now got heart-shaped bokeh, and I'll show you these in just a moment. So I've basically popped this cardboard ring where I've cut a heart shape out of it over the front of my lens, and it's changed the way that the light comes into my lens, and it's created these beautiful heart-shaped bokehs. But as a result, it has actually made the image darker. So I need to slow down my shutter speed to get more light in and bring it up to what? It was before. We'll take a lovely shot of that. And there we go. You beautiful heart shaped bokeh from this to this. And you'll see, obviously, it does make the bokeh smaller because it's focusing the light slightly more, but it is a beautiful, beautiful shape. Now, I've made a couple of these so you can get an idea of exactly how much fun you can have. And I'll show you them before the end of the session. I'm just popping another one on so this can be a nice little surprise for you. Hopefully, if it works properly. <coughs> Excuse me again. There we go. Star shapes. Nice and easy. You take a star shape. Okay. You can have all these lined up, ready to go, and just pop on the front of your lens. And I just use a little bit of low tack tape on the side to do that. So let's take a look at that. We've got normal bokeh, heart shaped bokeh, star bokeh, all from the 45 millimeter f1.2. Now, I'm either going to get shouted at or applauded for this one. I don't know what the bosses will think at all. But it's been a bit of a roller coaster of a year for many of us here at OM Digital Solutions. We are approaching the end of our first year as a new company with an absolutely amazing legacy of products. So I thought I'd do something slightly slightly patriotic and show my loyalty <laughs> for, for being part of the brand that we are. And we've now got OM shaped Bokka as well. And this is how much you can go in terms of chopping bits of bits of cardboard up. We'll take a picture there. 
So we've got our circular bokka, our heart-shaped bokka, our star-shaped bokka, and the OM Digital Solutions shaped bokka. There we go. That's my kind of final throw into the year uh, of what um, of what you can use these for. Now, bear in mind that adding these things uh, on does create uh, some slight diffraction because you are you're spoiling the light, so to speak, as it comes in. But it's a nice, fun, creative way to do things. <clears throat> so let's have a little look. There we go. So what they are is just a little circle uh, of cardboard. You can see this one's very roughly cut out, actually, this one. Uh, I think one of the children did this one for me, and some low-tack tape at the side. Uh, and that simply just sits on the front of the lens and creates these lovely images. I'm going to leave that one up there just now. Um, <laughs> I'll leave, leave the go. My bosses should be, somebody ring the bosses and make sure they're watching this bit. Yeah, excellent stuff. Um, right, let's have a, look at, a quick look at the questions. Um, again, if I've missed any of the questions, I will try and get to them as soon as possible afterwards as well. Um, Everybody is saying thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming and watching. Um, let's see what we've got here. Denise has asked, why are the snow people always in focus while the camera remains out of focus, save for the logo? So what's actually happening is that there is a, a focal plane, okay? So the snow people are very close to the same focal plane as the logo. So they're almost on the same line in reality. Uh, and then the rest of the camera is further back and then the lens is further forward, which means that that's where the depth of field drops out. Uh, Denise. So if you want to try and get things in line, you can line up the little snow people as far as you can, as close as you can to the plane, the physical line across the camera, which is where we explore things like depth of field. Uh, and if you can keep them in the same plane, same line, they will be focused. But if they're further back or further forward from the point that you focus on, they'll become blurry. And maybe we'll do something on depth of field next year as well. So that's a really, really great topic, uh, topic, topic to think about. Um, Photomaker has asked, if we don't want our foreground objects so bright and more moody, can we use live composite and light paint the foregrounds? Yes, thank you so much for asking that question. You can, you absolutely can. Uh, but the problem lies in the fact that we are shooting at, in, for example, for this at f1.2, which means that the aperture blades are wide open, letting loads of lighting. And we're doing that for the, for the bokeh, for the round balls. Now, using light, live composite, with a wide open aperture may potentially create some problems depending on how much ambient light you have available, but it kind of does work as well. So yes, you can, if you've got control of all of the lights, say in a room like this, but outside with other ambient light, shooting wide open to get bokeh balls and using live composite may be tricky. But great question. Uh, hi, David from Florida, good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Uh, David Stevens asked a great question. Should the focal length on the IS change automatically? Mine shows nine millimeters. No, let me show you that actually. So let me go to the bigger view, which would be that one. So what, um, let's just have a quick look. David Stevens is referring to is on the super control panel. Uh, the SIS section here, which is a still image stabilization. If we click on it, uh, it says focal length info nine millimeters above in gray. Um, that is purely for manual um, lenses without electrical contacts. So if you use legacy lenses that don't have electrical contacts or other lenses that can't communicate with the camera, you can press the info button on this screen and manually enter the focal length of the lens. This will tell the system to adjust the algorithm in the stabilization for that focal length. But if you're not using any uh, non-electrical contact lenses, you don't need to worry about that grayed out bit. Um, it's absolutely fine. It will detect um, all electrical contact lenses that you have in there. So don't worry about that, David, um, if you're not using the non-electrical contact lenses. OK, let's see what else we've got in here. Uh, are you concerned that ISO is flashing on these pictures by Trent? So yeah, so on occasion, the ISO will flash, which will say that it can't actually achieve a low enough or a high enough ISO to give me the exposure that I see. And more often than not, what it will do is it will give you a slightly darker or slightly brighter picture. So on the occasions where I'm messing around, it may flash ever so slightly, but if it does flash, I then balance that out with my shutter speed on this occasion. But I do keep an eye on it because if it flashes, uh, it means that the exposure that I'm seeing is not the exposure that I'm going to get. 
Um, <laughs> uh, oh, excellent. <laughs> Everybody, the uh, the Olympus elves in the background are loving the logo. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I think we've got Charlotte in there at Olympus UK who's helping out in the comments. Uh, Leslie saying, uh, Leslie uses gift tags with cutouts. That is a fantastic option as well. Uh, and Carla wants to know, did I miss your demo of using the 60 millimeter macro? Um, perhaps, yeah, it was in there. We were only really using it to show off uh, the focal length and the fact that the 60 millimeter has some sort of hexagonal um, uh, bokeh in there. But this is recorded, so you can play it back afterwards and have a little look at that as well, Carla. So let me bring this back in. Uh, there we go. Oh, you get to see my face massively on your screen. Um, so pretty much that's that's the session that I wanted to bring to you today. It's just showing you that you can explore these kind of Bokka, uh, creative Bokka ideas uh, across different lenses. And like I said, these four lenses that I've tried today are uh, by no means exclusive. You can do this on pretty much any lens. You just have to uh, play around with the distances from camera to subject and subject to background. Uh, there is loads of fantastic videos online, some by our very own wonderful Mr. Gavin Hoey, who has some uh, lovely Christmas Bokka videos out, so you can have a little check out of those as well. Uh, and of course, this is the last um, Tech Tuesday of 2021. So we will be now going into 2022 with a new Tech Tuesday that's going to be listed up very shortly, if it's not already listed up there as well. And we're going to be doing some more interesting sessions, including focusing on lenses, uh, and we'll be looking at how different lenses compare to each other. So hopefully you'll be able to join in for those. Uh, the Claire's will be back. We'll have lots from Get Olympus, uh, from Shayla, from loads of different people all around the world. Lots of cool stuff coming from us in the new year. So keep your eyes out. Um, I'd like to wish everybody an absolutely fantastic Christmas and a beautiful new year. Uh, and be with your loved ones as much as you can. But from me uh, here in not so sunny Cambridge in the UK, um, I'd like to say goodbye. Merry Christmas. And I'll see you on the other side. Bye for now. How can I help? That's plus three on the body, not on the flash at all. EPL8, and it is basically what... Hi, Captain, can you hear me? Hi. How are you doing? Can you see the tiger over my shoulder? Yeah. I can't move out of the way. There yeah, you go. I can see him. <laughs> <laughs> that was taken last, well, last March. Um, You've got a huge amount of technical knowledge. <laughs> Right, so how can I help? And then obviously make sure that there's still some background there, that that, that feels not filling it all completely. And I think we've got every camera body. Mm -hmm. and you've done all that hard yeah. work. You want to be able to keep utilising it. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. to utilise it as well. Beef for button. Oh, boy, yeah. Beef for button, yes. My camera here as well, so I can follow and oh, make yes, some notes. One's down to 15 metres with our case. Okay. okay. <laughs> video set. I can put basically what you can see here is the camera setting. Here at Olympus UK, we're doing everything we can to keep you inspired and improve your skills. We're sharing all of our expertise, advice, tips, and tricks to help you get the most out of your Olympus camera and use this time creatively. We all are looking forward to getting back out there with our cameras. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us online. Stay safe stay and stay home with us. us.